We focus a lot, Lisa, on what's happening with Hong Kong protests, uh, with uh, the latest coming from the High Court saying that actually they can reimpose a ban on face masks. This was highly controversial, and we look at the implication that has on the Phase 1 trade deal. It's wonderful that you're actually in Beijing right now, because that is where the focus lies right now, heading into year-end, the sort of big tipping point between a big uh, growth next year, potentially uh, gains at least in U.S. and European equities versus perhaps the opposite if there is no trade truce, Fran, Francine. Yeah, I think the, the, the problem is that if you're a trader, how do you trade? If you're a central banker, how do you mitigate that risk? Uh, we'll have plenty more of discussion on that. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News in New York City. Here's Viviana Hurtado. Hi, Viviana. Hi, Francine. Lisa, that's where we begin with China's President Xi Jinping. He stresses the need for equality in a trade agreement with the U.S. Xi making his first public remarks on a partial deal he could sign with President Donald Trump. He said China did not start the trade war. He adds it's something that Chinese certainly don't want. The government is in business until d December the 20th. That's because President Trump signed a temporary spending bill. It averts a government shutdown. The U.S. Congress is still negotiating the 12 spending bills that make up the budget. The biggest roadblock, White House demands for a $9 billion to build a wall along the border with Mexico. And the new president of the European Central Bank calling for a new policy mix. This to make sure Europe's economy will thrive. It was Christine Lagarde's first major speech since taking over. The first is monetary policy, and I'm saying that because it's my area of responsibility, which will undergo a strategic review due to begin in the near future. Lagarde also said higher government spending, especially on investment, is crucial. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and in TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Viviana Hurtado. This is Bloomberg. Francine, Lisa. Viviana, thank you so much. Now, first of all, it's very clear that traders and investors are trying to figure out how to trade the uh, how to trade the trade headlines. See what we did there. This is a picture for equities across the board. So European equities are slightly on the upside. If we bring a board up, I hope we have it. We should have it. Treasuries rising along with most benchmark bonds in Europe. Uh, one thing I didn't put, which I should have put, was the pound. It's actually falling, uh, following a gloomy reading of company sentiment. At least I just put renminbi just to remind myself what. I I'm paying for my uh, meals, but this was, you know, part of uh, the trade negotiation for some points. But since it's broke after that seven level, things that seem to be uh, less critical than before. But 704 is where Remnimbi is now. Yeah, really, it is a muted price action day without a clear sense uh, one way or another. Certainly heading into the U.S. Open with futures barely up, uh, and you can see how much bigger it is over in the U.K. with London's uh, FTSE uh, rising more than a percent. Crude taking a dip, uh, which is sort of interesting given there was sort of slight risk on feel elsewhere and the euro losing just a touch versus the dollar francine uh, Lisa, at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum, we heard from a number of executives on Hong Kong as a financial hub. This is after just moments ago, about an hour ago, we heard that a court temporarily has reallowed a mask ban, something that was very controversial. But this is what the chief executive said before we had that news. I spent some time in, uh, in Hong Kong. And it's a very complex, multi-layered situation. Broader business environment is still okay, uh, and the impact on our business has been okay. We saw clients and people, uh, uh, you know, thinking about contingency planning. So far, we have not seen an impact. Um, I think people are taking a kind of wait and see attitude, uh, and I think the central expectation that this somehow will get resolved. Obviously, with, 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 the, with the, the downward pressure on economic activity, I think we can expect to see some more impact from here. Uh, but so far, manager. To be honest, so far we haven't seen any any outflows or major uh, movements. I don't see any change in the behavior of clients that are significant financial players in Hong Kong. Well, joining me now here in Beijing is Bloomberg Selena Wang, who's been covering the new economy forum with me. Um, Selena, if you start with Hong Kong, so is this a legal matter? Before they declared this unconstitutional, now they say actually they can impose this ban for seven days. Extremely controversial. But is this a legal matter or is it a political decision? So this is according to the RTHK that there has been this reversal. As for now, it seems like it's more symbolic than anything because in the beginning it wasn't very effective anyways. And the protesters are going to be protesting regardless 
process of mass ban or no mass ban. Now, from the perspective of Beijing, we haven't heard from them yet about this most recent news, but in the original decision from the court to call it unconstitutional, they had denounced that. And they haven't said whether or not they're going to intervene more, but it does seem to set up the stage for more direct intervention into Hong Kong's legal system. Uh, also, we know that China has been indicating that they may want to intervene in the legal system a little bit more. There was a recent Communist Party communique that said they are pledging to improve the legal system. As for at the NEF, the topic of Hong Kong has certainly cut across the conversations about if it derails its status as a financial hub, what this means for trade talks. But as you heard from some of those guests, and I did speak to Bao Fun, the CEO of China Renaissance, earlier today, he said that mm -hmm. it hasn't had a big impact on his clients. They're not changing any plans. They're not making contingency plans yet. But is this going to worsen the protests? So if they if they feel like this is unfair, like this was you know a challenge that they had dealt with, does it mean that we could see more violent protests? It's certainly possible. I mean, at this point, we have seen seemingly small symbolic moves lead to a larger flare-up. So it is certainly a possibility in terms of the impact on the the financial markets and some of the conversations at NEF. I want to go back to that conversation with Bao Fun. He was reiterating that at this point you have things like the Alibaba IPO, other things that are actually boosting the market, which is a very big a divide between what's going on in the streets and what's going on in the financial sector. Thank you so much, uh, Bloomberg Selena Wang over in Beijing. Joining us now is Robert Hormatz, Kissinger Associates Vice Chair, Marty Schenker, Bloomberg Chief Content Officer. And I think it's fantastic that we have uh, what's going on in Beijing and then what's going on in the United States. Because the key question, Bob, is how is the unrest in Hong Kong affecting trade negotiations, especially given the fact that Congress, both houses of Congress, have passed a measure uh, basically saying that they stand by Hong Kong. Uh, in, in protest here? Well, so far, there has really been no linkage at all, and I think both sides are trying to keep it that way. The new bill that you uh, have just indicated has passed both houses of Congress uh, has uh, stirred a, a substantial reaction in Beijing, as one would anticipate that it would. Um, but in terms of linking it to trade, there really doesn't seem to have been any intent on, on either side to do this. The trade negotiations are developing and have developed a certain independent status. The Hong Kong issue is, is a very different set of issues. And is it possible to keep them delinked? I don't know, but I suspect both sides, at least this, at this point, are, are trying to do that. And, and so far, that seems to be uh, the case, yes. so far. Exactly. Um, I was in Beijing for a week, and there was really no indication uh, by the Americans I talked to there or the Chinese I talked to there that they wanted to have the two linked. And in Washington, uh, when you talk to the negotiators, they don't want to link them either. So, Marty, I would love to get your sense, given the fact that the unrest in Hong Kong perhaps uh, won't impede the ongoing negotiations. What's the latest in terms of whether we are close to phase one or close to pushing off the December 15th tariffs, uh, perhaps another couple months before they get a phase one deal done? Well, you know, like all negotiations, you're, you know, the fact that you're almost there means nothing until you have an actual deal. It reminds me very much of the European bank crisis when, uh, you know, there were reports and headlines constantly that they were close, but it took months for a deal to get done. So uh, I do think it, uh, both China and uh, Donald Trump want to keep these issues separate, and so far they've been able to do that. But, uh, Marty, the vice president, right, Mike Pence, I'm reading about it now, catching up on some of the news, just three days ago, right, saying that it would be tough for the U.S. to sign a trade agreement with China if the demonstrations in Hong Kong are met with violence. That's not really keeping separate issues, is it? Yeah, he was a sort of outlier there uh, because the Trump administration, we ourselves have been trying to get the White House to provide their view on this Hong Kong bill for weeks and couldn't get any traction at all from the White House. And it doesn't, and Donald Trump himself has not come out and said anything of, of substance on the Hong Kong protests. And you would think he would. The pictures are pretty vivid and then he, watched, uh, he watches television. So uh, I think Mike Pence is sort of an outlier. Uh, it's really what Donald Trump thinks uh, that matters most.